Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. There are many things in our world that we just expect to happen daily, and we take them for granted. We have factories that make steel, we have refineries that make our gasoline, and we have power plants that generate our electricity. We don't think about these kinds of abilities unless something goes wrong. And when things do go wrong, it's usually a very tragic event. People are usually hurt, and quite often, they perish. Today, I'm interviewing an award-winning engineer who spends his life working to prevent these kinds of disasters. That engineer is John Pushkar. John, thank you for taking some time out of your day to help us all better understand how horrible industrial disasters can be and what kinds of things can be done to help make sure they are not repeated. Thank you, Layla. It's a pleasure to be here and have a chance to explain some of my experiences and to share some of my knowledge. John, we were just reminded last week with the collapse of the condominium building in Florida about the kinds of disasters that engineers are called upon to investigate. I'm sure you've been following this incident in the news. Can you give us some thoughts about what happened? Yes, Layla, that condominium collapse in Florida was a terrible thing. Now, I'm not a civil or a structural engineer, so I can't directly address the root causes of the failure. But what I can address is the crisis of conscience that I'm sure the engineer who prepared a report a few years ago about the condition of the building faced. I've been down that path a number of times. Many of us in the profession have been as well. It's quite often the case that we're called upon to provide oversight to large, sophisticated projects or to inspect equipment where it's expected there's some kind of a problem. And oftentimes we have to deliver bad news. That's what I kind of call the dark side of engineering. It's something that they don't really tell you about in school. It's something that you kind of have to develop a skill for. It's an art. And even then, I'm not so sure that I have all the right answers. It's been kind of an arduous path to get to the point where I'm at right now. Many times in my career, I've had to tell people things they really didn't want to hear. They've hired me to evaluate things and to give an objective opinion, but then quite often when that opinion is given, it maybe doesn't fit with a budget or a schedule or even with a career path. It's made for, at times, a loss of projects, a loss of contracts, a loss of friendships. I've had to completely adjust my attitude towards what projects I'll take, the kinds of people I'll work for, and cultures where I know I fit and cultures where I know I don't fit. So I guess you're not talking about the technical parts of the job. You're actually talking about the human aspect. Absolutely. Delivering bad news and being able to very carefully and clearly communicate and articulate problems and break down very complex problems in the most simplest terms so non-engineers can understand them is something that you really have to work at and get good at if you want to be successful in this field. And being successful in this field doesn't necessarily mean making a lot of money, but it means being technically competent, communicating that, and getting the end result, which sometimes might be the shutting down of a project, the turning off of equipment, and in the end, it's these kinds of successes that save lives and provide meaning to my life. Wow, so I guess when you see or know something is dangerous, you feel a sense of responsibility to act. What does that mean? Let me back up for a minute and explain some of the responsibilities that engineers have. When you see the little letters P-E after someone's name, especially after an engineer's name, it means professional engineer. That's kind of our bar exam, our CPA exam. It requires a degree, first of all, from an accredited engineering school, a number of years of experience. It requires that people in the field who already have the license 
will vouch for you and your character. And only then, after all of that, do you get the privilege of taking a rather grueling all-day test. Once you obtain your license, there's also continuing education requirements. There's also then, for many of us, an oath that we take to belong to a particular professional society. And usually somewhere in those oaths is a pledge to protect the public well-being above all. The general public can sleep well at night knowing that for the most part, we are conservative, ethical, and moral people. In fact, in a recent survey, the engineering profession ranked third behind nurses, then doctors, for people that the public generally trust and people that are expected to tell the truth. I'm very proud of that, and I know myself and my colleagues, we take that very seriously. The problem is, is that sometimes telling the truth isn't enough. That's the crisis of conscience that many of us face when we're delivering bad news. In the case of the gentleman who wrote the report for the condo collapse in Florida, I'm sure he struggles daily with how far maybe he should have gone. And frankly, I don't know what more he could have done. There are situations where I've told people about dangerous things. They didn't want to listen. I've gone above their heads. They still didn't want to listen. There are limits to what in the end of the day we can do. There are also limits to what the, the nature of the individual preparing the report feels comfortable doing. And again, that's a very personal, ethical, moral choice. So what else can you do? It sounds like the engineer in Florida created a report years before the collapse. Well, that's the tough part, and there is no right answer. Let me give you an example of an extreme case. A good friend of mine who was a Vietnam veteran, when he got out of Vietnam, he became a mechanical engineer. He worked for a factory here in town, I won't name the name, but they made parts for helicopter engines. Some of the same kinds of engines that took him to his special forces operations in the jungles of Vietnam. He knew very well how critical getting in and out of landing zones was in Vietnam. He happened to be a quality control engineer. He noticed over time that some of the manufacturing processes just weren't quite cutting it. On the test stands for some of these engines, the performance was dropping off. He informed his management team about this and they did nothing. They did nothing and hid the problem over and over again. Having first-hand knowledge of what this could mean out in the field when you're relying on that helicopter to save your life, he had no choice but to become a government whistleblower. He knew the consequences very well of what he was doing. He immediately got fired, of course, and then for years he could not get reemployed. He could never use that employer again as a reference. It was very bad for my friend. His house got foreclosed. He stood in the street passing out flyers to the people at the sheriff's sale, letting them know that this was the home of a veteran. He eventually got a settlement. It was, however, many years of hell for him and his family. I admire what he did. Not many people would ever have done what he did. I know that he saved lives. This is an example of a very courageous engineer. Not everyone has that much courage. I don't know if I would have that much courage. I admire my friend for what he did. This is kind of an extreme example of what, in some cases, engineers feel compelled to do. Wow, I guess I never thought about engineers as our protectors for so many things that help us function normally. People have to be able to trust us. I've been escorted out of facilities where people wouldn't listen and, frankly, I wouldn't shut up or stop. I've been asked to leave the island of Puerto Rico after I was working at a drug factory and I found people doing very dangerous things with boilers that could have easily caused an explosion. And after telling the plant's management team about it and still not getting any response, I had to tell the corporate office that had hired me. Everyone was very upset and again, I was asked to leave and it was strongly suggested that I never even come back to the island. I now tell people that I can only do work for them if they'll accept certain ground rules. I tell them up front that 
If I go there and do my job and look at their equipment and I find something very dangerous, I'm going to ask them to turn the equipment off immediately. So I try to schedule these things with them so that if there are dire circumstances found, they can accommodate that request without a lot of difficulty. So the thought that engineers running around doing technical things is apparently only part of the story. I guess I never thought about the communications part. There's a spot in the engineering world for everyone. However, as most engineers grow in their careers, they eventually get more responsibility. And with that responsibility means that you have to develop that art at delivering bad news. You have to communicate effectively so that hopefully you gain the confidence of the folks you're working with and they actually want to take action. It's an entirely different skill set that's not taught in school. Again, it's a skill. Skills take lots of practice. It's an art form. It's kind of like part of how a professional athlete learns to hit a baseball or field a grounder coming at him. We have to learn and develop this skill of how to communicate effectively and how to articulate very complex things in a very simple manner. Do you have any suggestions for young engineers or engineers moving through their careers and facing these kinds of issues? Yes, Layla, at my online school, I have four modules that deal with some of the dark side of engineering. Uh, my attempts to help young people or people who are not experienced at these things, maybe who have moved into new roles, to understand what's coming their way. My four modules include 40 years of experience in 82 minutes. I have another module that's all about communications and public speaking. And I have another module which explains my entire career path. These are all available at the Prussian Technical Services Online School. Layla, I'm going to run a clip after our interview concludes here that is part of my 40 years of experience in 82 minutes, just to give folks a flavor for the kind of wisdom that I'm passing along in those modules. And that's really good stuff. How can someone access these materials? And again, they're all available at my online school at www.prescientts.com. Well, John, thanks again for opening my eyes to more of the world of engineering. I will certainly think differently in the future about some of the challenges that engineers have and not just the technical ones. Layla, thank you. I appreciate the chance to have shared this knowledge and to talk about some of my experiences. Most of all, I'm really happy to have been able to communicate maybe a bigger picture of the role that engineers play in society and some of the difficulties we face. Maybe I've let people in on a side of engineering that they've never realized even existed. Thanks again. And for those of you who have an interest who might be in the engineering field, stick around. I've got a little clip to play for you. Okay, well, now that we understand a little bit better whether or not your current position is threatened and how so, Let's move forward with the three most important things that'll define your future in the engineering workplace. I call these the three C's. It's credibility, culture, and communications. I'm gonna show you some things here and just kind of scratch the surface on these things. I wish I could tell you which one was more important, but they're kind of like the legs on a three-legged stool. You're going to have to become exceptional at all three of these to have a successful career. So I'm gonna start the discussion here on the three C's with credibility. Credibility is frankly our engineering currency. It's everything in the engineering world. People have to be able to rely on us. Being credible means not only being reliable about what you know, but being reliable about what you don't know. So. Make sure that if you don't know, you don't guess, you don't make things up, don't assume, be factual, tell people, I don't know. And I've also got some warnings for you here about software, especially modeling software. Remember the old saying, garbage in, garbage out? Well, remember, the, the output of those models is only as credible as 
what goes into those models. So kind of be careful. And likewise with instrumentation. You know, sometimes instruments, uh, we kind of put too much faith in them. They're, they're got a lot of blinking lights and they're really cool. But, you know, you've got to check for reasonableness and you've got to have some basic understanding of some of the laws of physics to double check yourself. Um, there's an, an example I like to talk about where I had a young engineer on a job and we rented a flow meter to, to meter the flow rate of water in some piping systems. And I remember him looking over at me and saying, uh, that two inch pipe right there, it's got 900 gallons a minute flow in it. And, and I was like, you mean 90? No, nope, no, nope, says right here 900. And I'm like, you know, do you realize what the velocity would have to be for 900 feet per 900 GPM in a two inch pipe? And after some convincing and looking and checking of things, he agreed with me it was really 90. So um, things like instruments, software, be really careful with the readings you're getting. And again, check for reasonableness. There, there's rules of thumb for everything. So have you ever walked in, looked at something, and after five minutes thought, oh, why does everybody think this is so hard? Uh, I clearly see the answer. Next time that happens, kind of bite your tongue for a while. Think, look around, talk to people who have been there a while. And, you know, if you don't have to give your opinion, unless you're really, really sure and you're asked for it, don't volunteer it, maybe not till you've got some experience and you've been around for a while. And lastly, try to learn to manage the art of expectations. It's really an under-promise, over-deliver world that'll get you somewhere. If I promise to paint your house in three days and it takes me four, you're kind of not in love with me. Uh, if I promise to do it in four and it takes me three, I'm a much more credible guy. So um, moving forward, uh, think about credibility as something that you don't get a second chance at. There's not a lot of people who can ever recover from a, a terrible credibility problem. It kind of means you're really on your way out to uh, much less of a career. A great way to build credibility, especially in a young career, is to get published. Write some journal articles, white papers, either for internal company use or externally to send clients or even a blog. It helps to create an image for yourself that you're an expert within the industry. Of course, you need to clear all your papers first with management and HR, and maybe they'll even have to have the corporate attorney review it. And Frankly, it's a great resume builder. Writing papers and articles and speaking at conferences is what eventually led to my book. An editor from John S. Wiley was at one of my conferences and approached me afterwards and said, hey, that was pretty interesting. You had a good crowd. Would you like to do a book for us? So there's frankly nothing but good things that can come out of you writing. And in fact, it's so important that we've got a separate course, which I'll be describing later, on improving your writing, public speaking, and communication skills. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong.